reading the text and the historical study kind of will review that a little bit. And I emphasize the importance of being able to read the text as a key, most important issue for the exegete. And, and we're going to do that today. I'll read you follow along. And if you want to kick in here and give me your own rendition, that's fine. We'll let you do that. We won't force that in any way. You'll have translation work on your own to do with it. Then the historical study. Now, we said now when you begin the historical study, the first place to start is with the book itself, right? And there's a lot of reasons why we start with the book, and one of them is certainly the historical side of it. But there's other things, too, with respect to it, um, just to get the theme, to try to figure out what themes are involved here, you know, what's the purpose, is the stated purpose here, what, where are we going, you know, how is it laid out, you know, where are the hard parts, where are the easy parts. You know, where does the atmosphere change if it changes, you know? Um, and those are the kind of things we want to kind of get a good feel for just before we begin detailed work, you see. You get a, a flyover, so to speak. And uh, it will certainly keep us, help us to stay on track when we are aware of the, when we become aware of the total content of the book as we're working on some verse in the middle, you know, and we got a question as to which direction this could go as interpretation in the total context of the book may give us some indication on that, you see. And we'll talk, we'll, we'll see that right at the beginning, I think, okay. So, <clears throat> that's what we want to want to do. Now, let's, uh, so, if you've got, a, and you do have, of course, a Bible there, Greek Bible, if I have to use that term, uh, it's the last time I use it. Now, the word Bible means either Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic text. It's one of the three languages of the Bible. Okay. How much is written in Aramaic? How much is written in Aramaic? A whole lot. One verse in, uh, in uh, Jeremiah, and then, of course, there's, uh, well, let's see, from 2 4 in Daniel all the way through chapter 7 is in Aramaic. And then there's uh, Ezra, the letters in Ezra and Nehemiah, they're in Aramaic. There's one or two words in Genesis, and that's about it. You know? <coughs> yeah. Okay. <coughs> Y'all got the uh, Bible open there? Okay. Well, now I'm going to, and at any point I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going beyond, and you can't quite figure out where I'm at. Just, you know, just slow me down or stop me there, okay? I'll be going pretty slow anyway, but I'm stopping to point out things, okay? <clears throat> so hopefully we can get through this and uh, can see some of the benefits of being able to read the thing. Okay, so we're well, beginning in verse 1. 1. Paul and Timothy, slaves and bond servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi along with bishops and deacons. So I'm going to stop there for a second. What we what we feel like what we've got right at the beginning of this thing here is a letter. Of course, we knew that anyway, right? Okay. So now, as a letter, um, a letter just like every bit of writing has a genre, relation to issue, related issues. In other words, there's a format for writing letters. Do I know what the format is? That's the question. Do we know what the format is? <clears throat> Let me just point, just go to the back of our notes, just to begin, that's on page 102, as a matter of fact, where we have the format for contemporary New Testament letters. I'm just going to point out these things, and as we move through, uh, this will begin to uh, help us focus the content better. Page 102, actually, it's starting with this one on one. We're not going to deal with that part. Just looking at the <clears throat> how a typical letter breaks down. It, I say a typical letter, if all the elements are there and if the writer is following in the typical pattern. Okay. Notice on this page 102, contemporary letter starts with an opening salutation involves sender, addressee, and greeting. Right? Okay, so in our text, we've got a sender. Well, that's Paul and Timothy. We've got to ask the question. All of a sudden, we're stuck now, really. We, we, there's a question, there's a historical question in mind at this stage. Well, is this a joint letter by Paul and Timothy, right? Or is, if not, why is Timothy mentioned in the salutation here? 
Let me see, that's the question. Okay, so there's a question, historical issue that's involved. And uh, if you wanted to track this down right away, which at this stage we wouldn't, I wouldn't, but this I would do at this stage, I'd just make a mental or written note to myself, but I wouldn't have to do that really, because when I start term analysis, I'm going to have to answer the question, okay? I'm going to have to deal with that before I can move forward, okay? And uh, so, I would, uh, so there would be a little note there in my mind or on paper. So there's an opening addressee. So the sender would be either Paul and Timothy or Paul and Timothy. Addressees, well, we know who they are here, we think, to all the saints who are in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Fine, okay, that's group. So all the Christians we would kind of assume there at that stage in the initial reading. But then it says along with the bishops and deacons. Okay, so then we got, we, we seem to have a combination, there's more than one group, there's the general, the general populace there, and then there's this other two groups. So that, that says something historically at this stage. Now I'm thinking, well, what time frame was this thing written, you know, and has the polity of the church developed in such now that they have divisions and bishops, deacons, and there are any other categories, you see what I'm saying? So now it's somewhat developed, right? So it's not a, a brand new um, church that doesn't have any formal <coughs> officers and whatnot, right? Uh, this text, unfortunately, doesn't show it. I mean, that's why I'm saying the, uh, the Nesalan text that you, some of you have open there probably show, not should show, a textual problem right there with the bishops and deacons that is a little note, right? okay? What they would do in this instance, what it would show up in the text or in the footnote would be the soon there soon. would go along with fellow bishops, right? Bishops. Right. So that would make a compound word, which means fellow bishops, right? And deacons. Now, that does a number of things grammatically. All of, all of a sudden, at that stage, I know I've got a textual issue to deal with. Because this deals right at the beginning with the addressee here. Because if that's true, if, that's the, if it belongs to be fellow bishops and deacons, okay, then what I have is a situation where Paul and Timothy are associating themselves as, you know, bishops in this instance. It also says it's all the saints who are at Philippi, and then that becomes appositional. The next becomes appositional. That is the bishops and deacons here, right? So the question is, is it then written to all of Betty, or is it only written to the leadership here, right? So it becomes a textual, an important textual issue, doesn't it? I know already that that's something I'm going to have to deal with when I work through the text. Okay? So that the address is, in the greeting, where's the greeting? Well, that's in verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Pretty typical Pauline greeting. Have more to say about that. I'm sure we'll deal with that uh, when we look at that textual analysis of all of that. And I'll get into it farther. So at least that part is there. Sender, addressee, greetings, some questions already of the historical nature that arise that will have to be dealt with at some point. Okay. Thanksgiving and blessing section often contains a prayer. Okay, that's a kind of a typical thing. Where does that fit in Paul and where does the body of the letter begin? That's the question. Here we would have to ask ourselves. You will be reading in Harvey this well before next time comes up in the, in the section you can look at. I'm, I won't have it listed for you to read that section on Philippians yet, but if you were to open up the Philippians and see that you see breakdown of Philippians as a letter, and you would point out as numerous other ones do, because this is pretty standard in this one, Thanksgiving section is from verse 3 to verse 11. And the key indicator that opens up the body of the letter is in verse 12, where it says, I want you to know. Right? That's where the body of the letter is. Okay, so I know that this is a Thanksgiving section, and it often contains a prayer. And in this section, it does have a prayer. And in this I pray, verse 9. Well, you know, a lot of prayer things here, but this I pray, verse 9. But the understanding what the Thanksgiving is, uh, section is is very important. I've noticed that here. I make some note of that here. Let's see. Oh yeah, the uh, 
thank underneath this whole thing. The Thanksgiving period needs further comment. This aspect letter provides occasion for the letter and the faithfulness of the people addressed. And uh, if it's and differs in different letters, but it's contained in the traditional prayer of intercession. Functions as a sort of yeah, this is key. Functions as a sort of shorthand indicator of the contents. So this is very important because then I want to make sure that I spend, when I work through this, that I spend enough time in this section so that I've got the content clues connected up, right? And so that when I'm moving forward, if I'm going to tend to interpret something that seems to be off the wall, so to speak, or off a different content, than what was indicated initially, I might want to look at that again and say, is, it, is this true? I mean, is he adding something that he didn't allude to before? He might have, okay? But basically, this is the key elements right in here that have to do with the content of the book, in shorthand, so to speak. And that's kind of going to be a guide then as I move forward. So there's the Thanksgiving section that I can define the body letter. Okay, when I get to verse 12, that's where the body begins, the ethical instruction and whatnot. Where is that going to begin? Well, there's a lot of stuff that runs throughout here, but certainly it begins in verse, uh, we certainly have some of that beginning in chapter 3. Finally, rejoice in the Lord and all these wonderful things that are mentioned there. Then he's got a conclusion, which pretty clearly uh, uh, comes to play at the end of chapter 4 where it starts, uh, verse 10, I think, I, you know, rejoice in the Lord greatly, you care, you know, your thought, your almighty hath, uh, sprung to life, etc., etc., and then he gives thanks for, um, you know, the conclusion and then the final greeting there at the end. So we can pretty much identify the, the aspects of this particular letter pretty well. So let's just go back to the beginning again in our reading. Now I got a sense for the letter aspect of it. So I rejoice, or excuse me, verse three. Now I give thanks to God, my God for all of you, okay, or in every mention or you. Now I know that from the grammar you can say, is this every remembrance of you or every mention of you? Now I know I'm going to have to work that out when I get there, okay. Then he says, always in every prayer of mine on your behalf, with joy, as I make. A particular request. There's an article with the ace in right there. Okay, I know I'm gonna, that seems to be somewhat significant. Okay, in fact, that's a second use of the word de aces, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. This is, by the way, just as an example of where if you're not fighting with the meanings of the words, you begin to see things that, uh, in context, that you might omit if you were struggling with words and meanings and things. So he seems to be saying here, and this is just a thought, initial thought, always in every request of mine. So in every request of mine, on their behalf, he's able to make a particular request that appears with joy. So whatever that request is, it's got to be something he's making in a positive vein and not something that he's <coughs> grieving over, apparently. Okay, so at any rate, verse 5, occasioned by your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Okay, so there's apparently some, um, one of the reasons for his apparently positive prayers here is their participation. The word fellowship means participation, right? I mean, that's in its basic sense, that which we hold in common. You are joining with me in a common endeavor in some form, in some fashion, right? Now, this, as some would say, is very, is very specific, and yet at this stage in the reading of the book, there's nothing specific about it. Okay. Does it have a definite article with it? So he's thinking of something in specific terms. But what is that in specific terms? Maybe we have to read on and see what he's got in mind if he alludes to it here. Okay. Now, there's another historical issue that comes up in verse 5 that, that uh, is part of this whole context, and that is your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until the present. When was the first day and what is the present? And, and how is it that they are participating with him during that whole period of time? Okay. So there's an issue there that may be expanded upon. We might expect that to be expanded upon. Okay. <clears throat> so his, in other words, the relationship between Philippians and Paul 
be something that had been ongoing and we might expect, since it's in this section, that he might say something about that further. Okay, uh, then verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that the one who began in you a good work shall bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, of course, there's been tomes written on this verse. I mean, we know that, right? And there have been, uh, this has been, uh, you know, somebody's theme verse for their hobby horses a lot of sometimes, you know. What does all that mean? Well, we're going to have to wait to the uh, detailed interpretation of this. What is it that was beginning? What is the work? Okay. Uh, the good work, and there's no article with it there. We'll look at that when we, we need to remember. We need to look at that when we really get down to the exegetical detail here. Something where God, who began something, is going to bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. But there's no article there, so what day is that? And how do you define all that terminology? You see what I'm saying? So that'll be something that we'll have to pay some attention to. I'm spending a little more time on the, on the uh, <coughs> Thanksgiving section because of its importance, and I'm just trying to emphasize the fact that I'm, I know what I'm going to have to do with some of this area, I'll spend a lot of time. We'll read faster later on, if that's okay. Okay, so at any rate, so there's a number of issues there, and this also then is going to have um, theological dimension to it that I need to interact with, right? So I know that that's, I'm going to have to deal with a theological dimension. Okay. <coughs> So I want to get through there. So as it now, verse 7, just as it is a proper or just thing for me to be thinking this on your behalf, because I have you in my heart, or you have me in your heart. There's, a, there's an infinitive clause here. And the question of the infinitive clause is, there's two accusatives. One's a subject, one's the object, which is which. I'm going to have to analyze that to see uh, on the grammatical level, on the stylistic level of the Apostle Paul, find out, in fact, what is he saying? Is he saying, I have you in my heart, or you have me in your heart? How, how does this work out? Okay. That's something that would have to be done. Both in my bonds, and in the defense and confirmation of the Gospel. Okay, All of you, and then there's this... Uh, Accusative absolute that occurs here. All of you are part fellow partakers with me in disgrace. Grace. Okay. So there's a number of things that occur there of historical nature. One has to do with this business of bonds. Well, that tells me something, and then all of a sudden I have to rethink of that. What does it mean by that? Okay. And then if we remember, or in our context, Remember, there's an issue as we work through this kind of stuff. <coughs> previous knowledge, well, if you remember Acts at all, you know, he's probably in jail in, during this time. This is a prison epistle, isn't it? But is he, is he in some hole someplace, or is he in a lesser um, confined environment? Well, the probabilities are, we've got our dating and things straight, that he's probably then in the Roman house arrest scenario here. But he is bound, and not bound in a sense. He may be tied to a guard, but he's not, you know, bound hand and foot and in a hole someplace, obviously. Okay. So then he's talking about defense and confirmation of the gospel. So there's an issue of legal issue involved, apparently, here, an apologetic that he needs to be making, but also you'll notice on the surface, well, I notice on the surface, <laughs> You know, both defense and confirmation are tied together with one article, which is making this a compound idea that he's not separating the two ideas, you see. So there's some sense in his bond, in being bound here in this historical scenario that he has opportunity to both defend, apparently, and to, uh, what should we say, give uh, positive, both defending, that's kind of a negative thing, I have to defend myself, on the positive thing, I'm trying to explain further the meaning of the gospel. Okay. All of you then, he says, and in, in grace, and this grace are fellow partners with me. Well, now, koinonia, above, find some connectedness with koinos, soon koinonos here, right? 
So at least we can say, well, part of what the coin and needle above, what their common thing, commonness with Paul in this instance, has something to do with what's going on in his life in prison, right? And he's tying it to this business of defense, apparently, and confirmation of the gospel. Okay, so their partnering with him has something to do with what the reason why he's there and what he's doing while he is there. He puts that in the context of grace. Okay, so that in itself says then something theological nature. Paul doesn't partic apparently. You know, we could do detailed work. It could come out maybe further, but he doesn't apparently looking at his bonding or that is pr imprisonment as uh, you know the worst thing in the world that could happen. He puts a concept of grace to it, which is a gift, a divine gift, if you will. And but not only that. There are partners in it, so their connection with it is a gracious thing as well. So there's just various dimensions to that, all, all the historical thing here. Um, so, at least reading that part, there's a lot of stuff to work on already at the historical level. But I'm not going to deal with those historical issues until I get to term analysis and start getting down to each part, and then I'm going to track it down and make sure I got it right and move forward. That's all I'm going to work with that. But at least I know that I got a lot of work to do here when I'm there. Verse 8 For God is my witness, how I long for you all with or in the compassions, characteristic of Christ Jesus. Now all of a sudden I'm into a. Uh, I'm into a what should we say, a theological application, a personal application that I can't avoid here. It, it's pretty much straightforward as a translation, but all of a sudden I'm asking myself, now what is he saying with this verse? God is testifying about me that what I feel, what I feel of you, okay, is kind of the same thing the same character pattern or the same intensity or at least similar intensity of the compassions that are characteristic of Christ Jesus. I ask myself the question just by application every time I read this verse is who in my experience, my human experience, my wife included, my children, anybody who in my experience can I say, God can testify to me that what I feel for them is very similar to what Jesus feels for them? And that, you know, that begins to push. And then you ask the question, how can he say that? And if he, and if he, and, and given the inspiration, I presume he's telling the truth here, okay? But how can, more important than how can he say it, is how do you get to that point where you can say it? I have a question. Yeah. Does this verse help shed some light on the double accusative in the previous um, in verse? Uh, I have you in my heart. I love you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Or Certainly, is a contextual factor, isn't it? I would think so. But then there's a grammatical issue you want to track down, and we'll figure out how to do that later. And actually, it's pretty simple. I say simple. What you need to do is want to figure out stylistically what Paul's typical pattern, if you can discover, discover that. And the definitive clause, whether it's two accusatives involved, what's its typical pattern? Where is its typical pattern of placement of the subject as, the, as opposed to the object? And see if you can track that down, use a concordance for that, find out the infinitives where there's two, see if there's any other diata in the infinitives, and actually there's only one in Paul. Thought, but there's other infinitive clauses that he uses, and then we can see if there's any typical pattern, and we can do that. And then we can come back and say, okay, there's a typical pattern. Is the context supporting that typical pattern? Mm -hmm. And this could be then one of the, one of the elements, certainly. Okay. okay. In verse, verse 9, and this I am praying. Okay, now that this, obviously, uh, moves forward. In other words, it's proleptic. It's, it, it talks about what's coming ahead. But as I do that, as I read that, all of a sudden in my mind, there's a, there's a question that I've already had from verse 4. Okay. 
Remember verse 4, always in every request of mine on your behalf, making this request with, this particular request with joy. What request is that? Maybe this is it. That's my question, you see, as I look through. And then it has to see if it fits, if what he's saying would fit the pattern, of, fit, fit the parameter up here, the request he's making with joy. So anyway, that's just a question of exegetical nature. Something I'll deal with as I work through it. And this I pray, that your love, yet more and more, might continue to abound in knowledge, accurate knowledge, and in every kind of spiritual and moral discernment. Verse 10. Okay. <clears throat> I take the hint of clause here to be, in this case, just simply an object clause. This I'm praying, that I'm praying is content oriented in this case. Then we've got a ta and the infinitive. Okay, here's actually one where there's two accusatives. It seems to be pretty obvious, which is which in this instance. So that you, subject, might be able to examine and approve the things that really make a difference. The aptera, peranta, right? That's what really makes a difference. Then we got a henna, in order that you might be sincere and blameless unto the day of Christ. Filled with law, or excuse me, filled with fruit of righteousness, that fruit which comes through Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Now the question is, that I know I'm going to have to deal with here, is is A style infinitive a purpose or result? Because it could be either. And is Hina a purpose or result? It could be either, right? How does that work out? And why, if they're the same thing, why do they use different, way, different uh, syntax for it? And if they're different, which way does it work? Which way does it go? You see what I'm saying? So there are three clauses here that need to be analyzed. And Hina, the first one, we pretty much know what that is, I think, contextually. The second one, you know, is that going to be purpose or result? And the third one, is that going to be purpose or result? Let's see, how's that going to work? Mm -hmm. I know, I'll just have to figure that out. Okay. okay. Well, at any rate, uh, that's the reading of that. So at least you're surveying that. I'm saying, okay, what are some of the subjects here then that, that seem to be in, included in this Thanksgiving section that it may come up, pop up later, you'll expand upon. Right, well, what do you see? What are some of the subjects? Anything? Remember anything? <laughs> well, fellowship is one. Okay, that issue of participation in some fashion, right, with him, that's one. Uh, is there a possibility of this thing about uh, he who began in you a good work, that is good work, something might be expanded at some point, at least the concept of God beginning something is going to bring something to completion, is that possibility? Mm -hmm. Or about the day of Christ, which occurs twice in here, that is related to the day of Christ, that is, and then we've got verse 11, which talks about, oh no, verse, uh, it? oh, day of Christ in verse 10, okay, and uh, how about there's a prayer that there are love abound? Loving, abounding, the issue of love. Okay, so why does he emphasize, the question would be, why is he emphasizing love? And it's not just any kind of love here, is it? It's love that is confined within the realm of accurate knowledge and moral discernment. Right? I mean, it's by the hint of love. I mean, the end phrase there, preposition phrase. So, so maybe there's an issue of um, love that he's going to need to do, wants to talk about. Okay? and expand upon and put that in this prayer context. And as a matter of fact, if that's the prayer that he talked about in verse 4, and this is the prayer, and the primary theme in verse in the prayer here is love as the primary theme. Okay. Uh, with the primary goal, at least, is the glory and praise of God. So, right? Uh, at the end of that prayer. So, uh, <clears throat> that may, there may be some something that we need to be looking for that, that has this love and glory of God aspect connected together. Yeah. It's interesting that uh, that can be found in the meaning of koinonia also, not just the fellowship, but a sharing in the arena of partake, but also the suffering to you obviously uh, encouraged by uh, their partaking uh, or obviously um, accepting is more growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But nothing is yet spelled out in specific terms here. Okay. 
So at this stage, at this stage in the reading, to bring a specific interpretation and a confined interpretation to, let's say, the concept of fellowship would be too prima would be premature. Yeah. Premature. And as a matter of fact, even if later on, and I'll bring this one up only because some people can't on it, even if later on you can bring in some more specificity to the concept of fellowship, the question has to be asked. Okay, it can be more specific, but is that the only thing it relates to? You see what I'm saying? In other words, at the beginning stage of reading this, would the readers more or less, more accurately, more, would the hearers connect it to that very specific thing and that's the only thing they think it involves? The answer has to be no. Well, my question was going to be, if this was being read for the first time to the Philippian congregation, right. when they heard your fellowship in the gospel, would they know at that point what he was referring to? It has to be in the context of initial, immediate context, and ultimately in the context of the whole letter. In immediate context, all has to do with somehow their fellowship and relationship to his being in prison and their participating with him some way, maybe many ways, you know, in his experience, in that ministry of the gospel, defense and proclamation of the gospel. That's all you get right here. Okay. So you think they would sit there going, yeah, I wonder what he means, and they'll get to the so. end of the book and they go, aha, that's what he meant by that. No, I don't think, I don't think they're sitting there wondering what it means there. I think in their sense, and we need to understand this, concept, the word, koinonia, encompasses a broad, a broad bunch of issues. Okay. Now, for instance, we know when we get to the end of the book because you, you know, you read ahead, you know. If you were hearing it, you wouldn't get it ahead. But if you read ahead, you'd say, well, he uses that a lot in relationship to the gift of money here. Right? And so to conclude, well, that's all that means is he's thanking them for the gift of money. He's occasioned by the money he's got. He's counting the money and saying, this is wonderful fellowship. That you've got. Would they understand that if they read? They wouldn't understand. That isn't it. They may say, yeah, we've helped him out, but actually he's not mentioning money here. He's mentioning this broader, more, uh, this broader context of his imprisonment and his defense of the gospel and the going forth of the ministry and their participation. And to say the only way they participated is to send them a few shekels. Yeah, that's probably way off base. Yeah. That, was, that brought up a lot of questions in my mind. The relationship Paul had to the Philippines before the letter was written. Yeah, and, that's and, important. And the history of that. Something we need to know. And this beginning section, at least, gives us a sense that it's a positive relationship. Yeah. It's not a negative relationship. Okay. Okay. Well, let's move forward a little, a little quicker because lunch is coming along pretty soon. We want at least <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go faster now, but I want to spend time on that part, okay? And maybe as we read through, we can ask ourselves the question, gee, was there anything in the Thanksgiving formula or section that this touches upon? Because let's go, let's start in verse 12. I want you to, uh, let's see, yeah. I want you to know, brothers, that the things that have happened to me are the things according to me, very literal, I'll be very literal so we don't get lose, lose one another the things according to me, rather come to the progress of the gospel have come out, or turned out, so that, verse 13, my bonds have become manifest in Christ, could be because of Christ, could be many way things there with the end clause, in the whole praetorium, all, and to all the others, okay, now, the praetorium, okay, now, number one, you look it up in the dictionary, number two, you find there's at least four dimensions to that, so I know that's a historical issue, I don't have to deal so whatever it is, He's in bonds. It's got something to do with the whole praetorium here, right? With, and with all the rest, whoever they are. And, verse 14, the majority of the brothers in the Lord having confidence in my bonds, something about his bonds had some effect on them, dared rather, more excessively rather, dared fearlessly to speak the word. Right? So somehow... What it seems to be saying here, just to get the context flowing, is, yeah, he's in jail, and there's something called uh, bonds and imprisonment and praetoria, and everybody seems to be hearing the word, and the Christians in the vicinity are being encouraged by what's going on, and he's not just, oh, well, it's me, and the whole world is Christian, 
the, you know, mission is going down the tubes here and saying this, this, is, this is going forward in a positive vein. I also notice that there's a textual problem here at the end of verse 14. I'm going to deal with that, of course. The word, it just simply says here, fearlessly to speak the word. Other translations have speak the word of God, right? That's something not to deal with. But because it may have a theological dimension there, aspect or something. Verse 15, you'll notice how this verse 15 begins with the men there, right? What this is, is sort of a, it seem, it's seemingly sort of a, um, not a, it's a transition, but a more defined element related to the brothers that you just mentioned here. Okay. On the one hand, some also, because of envy and strife, hmm, and certain also, others also, because of goodwill, are proclaiming Christ. Oh, so there's two groups. And then they both seem to be, the tenet seems to go back to brothers. So seems to be brothers in both instances here. It doesn't seem to be the brothers, you know, are uh, preach, proclaiming Christ out of goodwill. And the uh, non-brothers are preaching Christ because of envy and strife. Why would they be preaching Christ anyway? <laughs> so we got some, so we got a little question of Christians that are divided here, potentially here. Okay, one group, verse 16, out of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Oh, there's that word defense that I saw before, right? Okay, out of love. And there's that word love that we saw. It was one of his prayer things down there. Okay. But the other group, out of selfish ambition, Aretheus, right, are proclaiming Christ, not sincerely. Okay, there's an interesting little dimension here. Maybe that's got to do with something with his prayer that you mentioned. Not sincerely. You know, thinking to that maybe with their activity, thinking to raise up affliction in my bonds, that is, giving more trouble. Okay? So now we've got, apparently, some sort of, uh, historically in the area, some sort of difference of uh, opinion about Paul. And some people would like to find him getting worse trouble, and some people are, are just moving forward and thinking that this is, this is advancing the gospel. Okay? And this section you can see, and by the way, there's a textual problem here. The King James Version, if you had one, would show the verses, a couple of verses reversed here. They didn't understand. That is, the, uh, some of the, the early translators of the King James Version didn't understand the chiastic nature of this section, and so they re restructured the verses, changed the verses around. We'll get to that later. Okay, so then we got, oh, then verse 18. You can also see in some of this section here a little emotional involvement here. Okay? A little emotion and involvement in the sense of not including every little jot and tittle of, of uh, let's say, f easy flow conjunctions and it just makes a nice argumentation act factor you know, or even a description. It's just kind of a little more. Uh, Let's see, it's a little more not. I wouldn't call it erratic. I would just say you just when you get emotionally involved, you seem to leave off the unnecessary stuff. Get to the point, you know. In this case, just jump right in for verse 18. For what? I mean, you know. I mean, he could have he could have if he was just writing a dissertation, he would say, oh, okay, for what, and then go on with what the issue what relates to, right? But he doesn't do that. For what? Nevertheless, that in every manner. I mean, there's seemingly something left out there. But the context is clear what it's all about. But nevertheless, that in every manner, whether in pretext or in truth, Christ is being proclaimed. And in this I am rejoicing, but also I shall continue to rejoice. I'm you know, I'll connect that with the next verse. But so he is not, you know, woe is me kind of thing at this stage. Is he's pretty positive about what's happening? He's saying, hey, they want to preach Christ. Let them preach Christ. They're trying to get me in trouble with preaching Christ. Christ is being preached. I'm happy with Christ being preached, you know. So even though it gets me in trouble. But I know, verse 18, I'm going to continue to rejoice, for I know that this shall turn out to my salvation. Oh, wow, he hasn't he got, got saved yet. <laughs> <laughs> now he needs to get saved. Now there's an issue, right? Now, obviously there's an issue here in salvation. What does that mean? Okay. Through notice, notice how he's going to get saved here. Through your prayer and the support of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Right. 
somehow, whatever this salvation he's got in mind for himself has to do with, he sees, he sees that part of this, the way in which this is going to come about is the prayers of the 15 people. Right? Prayer apparently is not just a nice thing to do. It's a necessary thing to do, apparently. And you notice how I'm going to... I'm, I'm concluding too much, I'm afraid, in our reading. because I'm, But I just notice I just can't avoid some things. I can't... You notice how the one article ties both the prayer and the supply or support of the Spirit of Jesus Christ together. The two are tied together dramatically. So he doesn't want them to break it apart and make two sermons out of it. This is one thing with, one thing with two sides to it. <laughs> well, According to verse 28, to my earnest expectation and hope, and by the way, those are tied together as well, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but in every, with all confidence, as always and now, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether through life or through death. That's his personal uh, aspiration, that regardless whether they, they get me in more trouble than they kill me or or put me in a worse prison, or whatever else. Christ is going to be magnified either way, and so I'm happy with that. Or, and then your theme verse. Don't, before you say, this is my life verse, it's been my life verse for years, you know, you need to think about it a little further, maybe. For living means one thing to me. Living, that's an infinity, present infinity. Process of living, continued life, means Christ. That's all it means, says Christ. Okay. Focus just on Christ. It, no, no self, just Christ. But, Dying, the act of dying. No, that's a disappointment. No, no, that's not what he says here. It's gain. Oh, wait a minute. Right. Christ, living means Christ. I mean, that's my whole focus, but gain. To, to get, to be better off and be, to die. I don't know that I'm there yet. You know what I mean? I guess I'm preaching a little bit. But I just, I'm not so sure in my life that I have come to the place where my whole focus in life is Christ. I'd like to think that's true. I know that in some ways it's not. I mean, I'm honest with myself. You guys are different than me. Probably. The dying is gain. You know, I haven't looked forward to the, the day I die saying, gee, I can't wait to die. No, I just haven't done that yet. You know? Just to hear that most of us switch those two around. For to me, living is gain, and then dying will be Christ. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now verse 22 is good. Now, you'll notice the syntax gets a little awkward here, because I think, again, the, uh, the emotional dimension is coming back into play pretty strongly here. For me, that he means Christ, died the act of death, gain. But if to live in the flesh, that's all he said, to go on living in the flesh, then this, this to me, a fruit of work. There's that word work again. What does that mean? You know, right? And the product, fruit, product of labor, work, effort, whatever. And what I shall choose, I don't know. I know what my choice would be. Option would be to live or die. I might, right now, my choice is to live. <laughs> I don't know what I'd be. I'm constrained from two things, he said. These two things. Having the desire, the epithemia, the strong desire in a context, a native context, it's lost, right? But a strong desire to depart, that is, take my tent down, and to be with Christ, for this is better by far. Okay. Right? But to continue on, Epimene, verse 24, in the flesh is more necessary because of you. And now, and it, now you can see where this syntax starts to uh, be fully, more fully developed. That is, the words are more, the sentences are more developed, and is, he's starting to now to get less agitated you know, in his uh, excitement here. Divide and bless more necessary because of you. And this, having confidence in this, I know that I shall abide and I shall continue along with all of you, abiding along with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, in order that your boasting might abound in Christ Jesus in me through my coming again to you. Now that reads real smooth, right? He's just kind of stepped down a notch. And he is now just describing certain things. Not a thing you could say about it, but it's just a long time. Okay. Now verse 27 begins 
begins with a word that seems to insert and maybe some, uh, some, if there's any negativity, some possibility of something that may be wrong here that you might be getting at. Only conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel of Christ as a citizen. Now that implies that maybe there's somebody who's not quite conducting themselves right, right? Maybe that has something to do, as time goes on in our reading of this, with his prayer there. Maybe it has something to do with that. And, and, note, and note the word order. I know you're not into word order too much yet because you're not reading maybe real smoothly, but the, the, the uh, conduct yourself as a citizen is pushed forward, or yeah, it's forward because the other stuff is pulled to the primary emphasis point. Oh, see, only in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ be conducting your life. That whether having come and seeing you or being absent, I hear your affairs, the things concerning you, that you are standing fast in one spirit, in one soul, just being literal here, as you are striving together for the faith of the gospel and not being terrified in anything by the adversaries, which, something you have to deal with, and has seemed to that, which is to them a token of ruin or destruction, but of your salvation. Ooh, and this from God. Right? Now, there are certainly indications in there that maybe all is not perfect. Right? But there are some adversaries in their situation that maybe there's, they're not standing fast in one spirit and soul as they're working together for the gospel. Maybe there's a little bit of, maybe there's a reason why you prayed for love. Right? And about you know, things that really matter, discerning the things that really make a difference. Maybe there's a reason for that in that prayer. That maybe it's starting to come through a little bit. Because, verse 29, to you it has been given, and then notice this, and we'll actually, we'll, when we work on diagramming a bit, we'll just put this on the board and see how it flows. But see the article with, pair with a prepositional phrase, ta who pair Christu, okay. That becomes a subject for the verb, okay. And then, not, uh, so this, on behalf of Christ has been given to you as a gift of grace. Well, what is it? Well, not only to be believing on him, but also to be suffering on his behalf. And when we grammatically tie it, when we put the grammatical diagram on there, you will see that the two infinitives are embedded in that one article on behalf of Christ becomes a subject as a gift of grace. So not only is gift, or not only is believing a gift of grace, but suffering. I'm all for the first part. I don't know about this. <laughs> uh, having, ver verse 30, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now you are hearing to be in me. Well, so there's apparently some conflict there. Now it's starting a little more definitive here, isn't it? And it has some internal and external dimensions. Somebody's an adversary and there's potentially some lack of agreement internally. You know, strive together. One spirit, one soul, right? And so there's some internal, external thing going on here, and he puts it in the context of uh, some sort of conflict. So that's chapter one. Okay, chapter two. Notice starts with the un. Okay. Uh, now he's drawing some sort of inference from what he has said. Okay. And notice where it goes and how it develops. To this later on, more specifically, but if anyone, oh, but if there's any consolation in Christ, notice no, no conjunction. Uh, I mean, no, uh, like an and, right? It's just kind of um, what should we call it? juxtaposed two if clauses are juxtaposed together here. Okay? If there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, there's that word love creeping up again, and then consolation or yeah, consolation and comfort, those words are almost synonyms, so that makes it, that's going to be a question when I get down to that point, 
Notice again, if any fellowship, what's that word again, of the Spirit, and then another if clause, if any compassions and tender mercies, and what's the difference between compassions and tender mercies? You know, and, uh, and, 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 and if there's a close connection between comfort and uh, consolation, there seems to be a connection between koinonia and compassions and mercies as well. well something to look at when I get there. When he's doing these, these if clauses, um, because he's going to do that again in four, is it, is, is it begging the question, is there any among you? Oh, you're going to have to, oh, in, if there's any consolation question, you know, is there any, is he asking that question? Yeah. Well, of course, it's not laid out as a question. Right. But is that kind of between the lines? Is, is, as far as he's well, kind of saying it in a nice way, but is there any of this among you? Because if there is, that's what you, you know. Mm -hmm. You have to go on to ask, initially ask a grammatical question, well, what class condition are we dealing with here to begin with? Okay, so that's the first thing to ask. And I would say, well, the first class, and or a general, general meaning no implications, or first class meaning, yeah, there is. Okay. So I mean, you have to kind of deal with that. That's, so that's a grammatical issue that we'll face when we start the, you know, I mean, we know that we're going to have to deal with when we, when we face it. So it's a good question, but Jake, no, because when I get there, I'm going to have to analyze that. Okay. Uh, fulfill. Now that's a protasis, so the, full, uh, the verse 2 begins the apotasis. Fulfill my joy, right? So, oh, okay, so there's a sense in which um, maybe his joy is not as full as it could be. Fulfill my joy that, what? You'd be thinking the same thing. What? You're not in agreement of everything? Maintaining the same love, well, maybe, oh, gee whiz, there's that love again, that prayer, that was in his prayer. And then no conjunction, simply being harmonious ones. Well, maybe there's a lack of harmony, which is implied, of course, above in verse 27, isn't there? So maybe he's getting a little more specific here. And then it continues on in verse 2. The one, thinking the one thing, well, he just got done saying that you be thinking the same thing, the thinking the one thing, right? Well, so now we're repeating ourselves again? Okay, so what kind of rhetorical thing going on here? And keep in mind, this is for the ear, right? Rhetorical thing. Verse three, nothing according to selfish ambition. That occurred before, that's about some of those brothers there who for selfish ambition were trying to get them in trouble. Nothing according to selfish ambition nor according to vain glory. Right? But in humility of mind, regarding others or one another better than yourselves. Let's see. Each one, or not the things of himself, each one watching out for, but the things of others. Each one the things of others also may be, depending on the text of the problem. And then, of course, our famous passage, be thinking without a conjunctive, notice, so it becomes kind of a capsulization of things, it seems. This be thinking in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, in the form of God being, not something to be grasped for, or in the translation, regarded to be equal, the matter of being equal with God, but emptied himself, and that's it, theological term, but also one that needs to be word study. We know that when we get there. But himself he emptied, having taken on the form of a servant, in the likeness of men having become, oh gee, and then the next phrase, and in the fashion having been found as a man, boy, that's almost tautological. That's going to raise a question on the rhetorical nature of this. He humbled himself, having become obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Well, he humbled himself, I mean, We've got, we've got a number of things, and this is where the text can speak to you, if you're smoothly reading. Go back to verse 3. Nothing according to sampling ambition or according to vain glory. Kenodoxion. Right? What is a key word that occurs, the main verb occurs in verse 7? Kenodoxion. Con there's a connection there, and the but. In verse 3, but in tape frasune, that is, lowliness of mind. And what is the key word that occurs down in verse 8? Tape now, right? Humble, right? So there's some sort of interaction going on here in relationship to those ideas. You see what I'm saying? 
So the, what he's talked about in verse 3 is being expanded upon in the Christ event in verses 7 and 8. Okay? Which may have some theological ramifications when you work with the kenosis concept there. We we'll, won't we'll talk about that now. Wherefore also God, verse 9, exalted him highly and gave him of the name above every name, that of the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and of things on earth and of things subterranean on earth, and every tongue should confess that Lord is Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise, but to the glory of God, Father. Okay? So that's a, that's a section that we know already. This is going to have a lot of work to do here. There's the rhetorical aspects to this that need to be dealt with, and we're certainly getting into the heart of any problem that occurred that he was observing, and that certainly is a key reason why he's writing this letter, you know, and that certainly seems to reflect his key prayer there for love, the right kind of love to abound, right, and uh, to discern what really is important and not to worry about the lesser important issues, apparently. That's what the prayer was all about. So those things are certainly significant. Verse uh, 12, we'll continue reading on here. Wherefore, my brothers, just as you have always obeyed, uh, that's a positive note, yeah, yeah. not as in my presence only, but now rather more in my absence. Okay, good. Okay, they're still in positive. With fear and trembling, your own salvation be working out. Well, he already talked about his salvation. Now he's talking about their salvation, then working it out. Okay, so what kind of salvation are we talking about? And we know we're going to have to deal with that. For God is the one who works in you, both the desire and the working on behalf of his good pleasure. Actually, a God here, without an article in this kind of a clause, is really a predicate, but it's pulled forward. So really, if you're going to restructure the English with emphasis, it would be the one who's working in you. And we've seen that phrase before, by the way, the concept of God who began, remember, the very beginning in the, you know, in the uh, Thanksgiving section? He who began in you a good work. Well, maybe we're part of the good work is involved with this here. Okay? So he who began in you a good work. Well, anyway, for the one who is working in you both the desire and the effort of working on behalf of his good pleasure is God. Right? And then no conjunction. So now he's getting, you know, there's a little more speed in the writing here, if you will. Let's leave off the unnecessary stuff. All things will be doing without grumbling and disputing. Well, gee, what does it mean you got some grumblings and disputings there? Well, maybe there's a reason for his praying about love again, right? Okay, um, all things without grumbling and disputing, that you might be blameless and harmless, children of God, blameless ones in the midst of a crooked, uh, distorted or cro crooked and depraved generation, among whom you are shining forth like luminaries or lights in the world, holding forth the message of life, for a matter of boasting for me on the day of Christ, that word day of Christ reappears, that I did not run in vain, and nor did I labor in vain. Okay. And then a personal note, but although I am being poured out as a drink offering, literally verse 17, in the interest of your, the sacrifice and service of your faith. Hmm, that's an interesting thought. I rejoice, and I continue to rejoice, or I want to continue to rejoice with all of you. And as far as this is concerned, also you. You be rejoicing and be rejoicing along with me. So one of the participation aspects he wants to happen is both of rejoicing, everybody rejoicing in this. Okay. So at any rate, that's that major section. Because now it changes the tone of the theme a little bit. So uh, that, that section certainly seems to be growing out of the... Out of the uh, Thanksgiving element. And it seems to connect with the last part, the verses 27 to 30 of chapter 1 as well. It seems to be a developing concept here. The implication in the last of uh, 1 and the first of 2 is that there may be some disharmony there. Exhortation is be harmonious in two, the illustration of Christ, you know, has perhaps has something to do with God who this business of salvation. Right? And, and, okay, 
moving on. Now I hope in the Lord, Je in the Lord Jesus, Timothy, as soon as I can, to send to you that also I might be refreshed when I know the things concerning you or how you're doing. So there's a sense of a little anxiety apparently on his behalf about them, probably related to the fact that you know, they might be arguing with one another about something. For I have no one, and this is a very calmly and coolly collected section here, for no one do I have, like soul, like mine, who genuinely, the things concerning you, shall have a concern, a care. For all are seeking their own things. Oh, gee, that's kind of, that kind of reflects back upon everybody not, you know, not the things of their own be seeking, but blossoming out for other people, right? Oh, now here in this passage, seems to be a reflection of that. For all, the things of themselves are seeking, not the things of Jesus Christ. But his character, you know, that as a, as with a father, a son, along with me, he served as a slave in the gospel. So he's kind of given a, a high regard to Timothy, who he wants to send as uh, back to them to help him out in some fashion or another. Twenty-three. This one, therefore, Timothy again. And I hope to send as soon as I know. That what's going to happen with me here. He wants them to know what's going on in his scenario when he goes back, so they're not wondering about it. Okay. As soon as I can. The things concerning me, right away to tell you. For I have come as the Lord, that also he, or excuse me, I myself, I myself shall come quickly. Oh, now there's some indication that he thinks he's going to be able to get out of jail. So some have concluded, well, maybe what salvation means when he says, well, this will turn out to my salvation, some have concluded my release. Well, is that what it means? I mean, that's a question, right? Uh, but in that passage, he was talking about possibly dying. Here, he's talking about getting out of jail. So we have to work on that. Okay. Now there's a transition to another person here. Now we get some more historical data. Okay? For I regard a necessary thing, Epaphroditus, the brother, and fellow worker, and my fellow soldier, and some of my will do all of that. So we got my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, and your, notice the juxtaposition between my and yours, okay, that's just a grammatical thing, your apostle and servant, in as far as my need is concerned, to send to you. Because so, I mean, it seems a little awkward, doesn't it, on the English, I mean, you restructure it in English, but actually it's a, uh, it's what it's doing, it's fronting all the high key elements that describe this individual and his high regard to this individual. And then verse 26, since he was longing for all of you, that's the same word, by the way, that he had in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 8, about his uh, concern about them. He was longing for all of you and he was in distress. Okay, because you heard that he had been sick. Oh, there's a, there's a interesting thought. I mean, my depression is because you're worried about my health. Right? Well, when I'm sick, I'm worried about my own health. I mean, that's, that's where my discipleship apparently has arrived at. You know? And his concern was, geez, I'm sick and I'm about to die, we're going to find out here. And uh, I wonder, gee, they're all upset about their, how upset are they about my, you know, that's a little twist there. I mean, that's not quite According to the way I'm living right now, I mean, uh, I'd like to think that I'm more concerned about how you feel about my health than about me feeling about my health. <laughs> right? So it takes discipleship to another level, I think. But also, he was sick. Near to the point of death, he said in verse 27, But God had mercy on him, not only on him, but also on me. Okay? So that I might not be having grief stacked upon grief. Therefore, okay, more quickly or, you know, enthusiastically, I sent him back. Oh, I sent him back. Now, there's a historical note. Is he the, is he the one who's taking the letter? Is he the one who is then on his road back with the letter in hand? And therefore, is this an epistolary arrest? Which in the form would be, I mean, in, as he's writing, as we, I am sending, but in epistolary errors would be, you know, as you get it, I send it, right? Okay. So that, seeing him, again, you might rejoice, and I might be free from grief, okay? Therefore, 
you know, received him in the Lord with all joy, and such as these hold in high regard in Timos, verse 30, because because of the work of Christ, that work, word working in, because of Christ, under the point of death he drew near, risking his life in order that he might fill up your service or your lack of service on my behalf or toward me. So he was working on their behalf. He was the apostle that is sent on a mission to help. So this is part of the, apparently this is part of them, the, uh, the joint fellowship business is of the Thanksgiving section is coming back. See, their, uh, their participation with him involved, not only they're probably uh, praying for him or whatever, concerned about him, but at least at this stage in the letter, they had sent an emissary with, you know, some help, right? And so that's certainly part of it, right? And so it's developing out of that initial section again. Okay. Mm. Questions thus far? Continue reading on here before lunch. Uh, finally, my brothers. Now, it sounds sound like he's about to uh, say, well, this is it. I'm going to say goodbye now. It's time for lunch. I'm so late. <laughs> <laughs> now. But it certainly is a transitional statement because he goes on over two chapters, right? Okay. Finally, my brothers, be rejoicing in the Lord. To write the same things to you, for me is not a grievous or burdensome thing, but for you it's safe. That's an interesting phrase. It's safe to repeat myself here. Okay, now he gets agitated. Now there's no question now the agitation that occurs in, verse, in chapter 3 and starting in verse 2. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the concision or the mutilators. I mean, that's, now not only is there, it, it just busts right out there, you know, uh, but if you if you pronounce it, if you hear it, if you listen to it, it, it really impacts it as a pounding on a pulpit. Pulpit. Look at just in case you've never noticed it. Blepita tus kunas. Okay. Beta tau kappa. The beginning of every one of those letters. Blepita tus kakus ergata. Same letters. You see right. Same sound pattern coming through. Blepita tame karatamein. You see, same sound pattern. You see what I'm saying? So, again, this is written for the ear, right? Mm -hmm. And you cannot, listening to that, without, you know, smooth transitions, and whether you're beware of this, oh, and oh, yeah, by the way, think about it, and look out for this, or, you know. It's not, it's just bust right out there, he's, like he's standing on a pulpit, you know, and you cannot avoid but to, to, but to perk up your ears at this stage. Uh, so you certainly got something to say. For we are the circumcision, those who serve, now there's an interesting phrase here, but I'll just read it this way, this, the Spirit of God, or by the Spirit of God, and boast in Christ Jesus, and don't have confidence in the flesh. Um, although I am one who could have confidence also in the flesh, right? So now there's a personal note, but it seems to reflect upon somebody who's in their environment that he is classifying in negative terms as dogs, evil workers, and mutilators. Right? And it's got to do something to do with Judaism, because he's talking about circumcision. Can I, can I ask a quick question about the, uh, the hearing of this? Uh, mm -hmm. in, in a practical sense, in, in preaching, of course we're preaching out of English, but I don't even know that pastors often nowadays even read a passage before they preach on it, and yet I wonder how we can carry over the same impact of the hearing in our preaching. And since you're talking about this right now, I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, number one, it takes effort and work to be able to figure out how to do that. Okay, right? Now there may be some ways in which we could do that. We can give an explanation. Read this text, like verse 2, read this text and now explain that, how that that's one way to do it. And maybe we can figure out, work, work, work with a thesaurus enough to figure out how we can you know, kind of replicate that factor. You see. Um, but it takes work, it takes effort, it takes, you know, a concern about trying to transfer that kind of data into the congregation or the hearers, you see. Uh, so 
just a comment. This isn't, of course, I'm preaching necessarily, but maybe there's something we could learn here. Since preaching is done to be heard, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that we need to take greater care, perhaps in our choice of words. We need to think things through. How is this going to sound? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Paul Paul knew that and wrote that way. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do think that there are, there are a lot of us that that need to spend more time thinking about how this is going to sound to our ears, as well as the content. Right. I think you're right. We yeah. better in, in our English versions. Mm -hmm. Reading our English versions to, to our people. I mean, can we can we expect some of this impact that obviously is written in the, in the Some of it we can. Okay. For instance, the word uh, beware comes up in English. <coughs> beware, beware, beware. We could do that. You can't get the article in the in the first letter right off. Beware of the dogs. Okay. Beware of the evil workers. So you really have to explain there that the sound pattern for the dogs and the evil workers is the same sound pattern. If we were at a concision, we'd have to say that. Okay. Unless we can figure out with the thorosaurus how to do it. the canines. How to do it. Beware of the concision. <laughs> Beware of Steady, this guy got it down. All right. <laughs> but even explaining it like you just did to us, is it ever appropriate to use the, the Greek? And, I mean, you can hear it in, in those words. You can. You can. And uh, I, uh, what I have done, not in the preaching, but what I have done in Sunday school class occasionally, when I have something like this, I just put, I just put it, I just flash it up there, and just show them. Even though they can't read it, they don't know what it was. I can point out, look at this, look at this. You see them saying, you point out the things, and then sound it out for them, and all of a sudden, that's as far as you know. That makes. But anyway, it, it certainly changes the tone. That's what I want to get at. I mean, that's what we're working on. It's just, the tone is all of a sudden dramatically changed here. Okay. Okay. So he's moving on to something else, and it has to do with Judaism. It has to do with um, people who apparently are having confidence in the flesh. Okay. Although I could have confidence in the flesh, if anyone seems, other person seems to have confidence. But I'm old. Now he's in a boasting mode here, apparently. <laughs> and then you notice how he multiplies his own pedigree here, so to speak, you see. An eighth day, let's see, a circum in circumcision, an eighth day person. I mean, that's the Jewish way, right? I mean, that's a person who's, their parents have got it together, right? Uh, of the race of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, that is, I'm on top of the heap. As far as, according to the law, a Pharisee. Now we're really, you know, we're really pushing things here. According to zeal, persecuting the church, according to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. Right? I mean, just stacked upon one another. He's really getting emotionally popped up on this one here. here. And then, but then it starts to climb down a little more now in verse 7. It starts to collect itself more, we begin to see more conjunctives and more filled out word uh, sentences and stuff. But what things were to be gain? Now, you see we've seen that word gain before and it was in chapter one, wasn't it? Whether there's any connection or not here, the question you'd have to want, maybe want to question, but at least it occurs up again. These things I regarded because of Christ loss. But, and then we've got this I mean, we've got one, two, three, four, five conjunctives here. So there's a grammatical issue I want to deal with when I get there. Five conjunctions, conjunctives. But what I, but, and, and D, let's see, if we would put them all together and say, but, and these would be intensive particles, but, menungekai would be all intensive. But, uh, how would you intensify all that? <laughs> But, but indeed, also, I am regarding all things lost because of the superabounding or greatness of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, because of whom all things I have suffered the loss of, and I, have, I regard be dung, that's a strong word, that I might, that Christ I might gain, there's a word gain again, there's that concept of gain and huh? Chapter 1, and I might be found in him, not having my righteousness, that which comes from the law, so now we're that Jewish, somehow there's a Jewish connection here that relates to righteousness as they interpret it, but that which comes through faith in Christ, that righteousness from God based on faith, right? 
to know him, verse 10, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, there's that word, of his sufferings being brought into conformity to his death. And then the strangest of all, right? If somehow I might attain unto the resurrection or the out-resurrection from the dead, you've got to get saved. It's going to raise a question in exegetical. So there's something I know I'm going to have to work on, right? And there's a, so there's a hop ox of God in there. It's the old word only occurred one time. Ex anastasis, etc. So there's a lot of interesting things there. Okay, so now he's calmed down a little bit. But he's still somewhat agitated. Not that already I received or already I have been perfected. Oh, okay. So somehow maybe what he's talking about is not initial salvation, but perfection here. But I am pursuing, if somehow I might attain that purpose for which also I have been obtained or grabbed a hold of by Christ, Christ Jesus. So he's seen that he, there's a purpose in his life that Christ had for him, and that's what he wants to Fulfill, apparently. Brothers. Now, having just said brothers, you know, he, he's, you can see where he's starting to calm down a little bit, you know. You know, he's, he went for coffee, and now he's back, and cool and calm and collected again. Brothers, you see, I myself, I'm not regarding to have attained, apparently, verse 12. Okay? But one thing, the things behind, on the hand, forgetting. But... Stripe, stri uh, stretching out for the things that are ahead of me or before. I am pursuing according to the mark for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Upward calling of God. When we, and, and then this is what I'm saying again where the text begins to speak to you again. I've had an upward calling concept, even not bad words, but an upward calling concept in my immediate context. And that's in that strange verse 11. Somehow I might attain unto this resurrection, this out-resurrection from the dead. Now we've got this upward calling. Is there a connectedness? In fact, is, up, is this upward calling, if you will, a, a sort of definition of what we're talking about with that hot box of omelet? That is, that word that only occurred one time. It's a question that you that you want to deal with when you get there, you see. Okay, where am I at? Okay, verse 15. Therefore, as many as are perfect, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all of us, yeah, that's all. Let us be thinking this way, okay? And if any other way you are thinking, also this God shall bring, us uh, shall reveal to you. Okay? In other words, reveal you, you're off track on your thinking, apparently. Nevertheless, that point at which we have attained by the same rule, walk. In that same way, walk. There's infinitive uses and fair okay. okay, so that's a personal. Uh, he really got hopped up with this. Uh, these apparently these Jew, Jewish persons who were claiming things that uh, maybe these are part of the people who. Well, no, here's another historical dimension that I'll mention that comes out, uh, at least for me. He had talked in chapter 1 about brothers, some who were on his side and some who were not on his side. Would he consider any Jews brothers? Okay. Okay. Now here's, here's an element of, uh, of his history here. <clears throat> At the beginning of the Christian church, this is what previous understanding comes forth, I guess. At the beginning of the history of the Christian church, Christianity wasn't separated from Judaism. Right. It was a sect of Judaism. Right. Right. At what point, historically speaking, did Christianity and Judaism become split and they were considered, therefore, separate religions? That's a historical question. Okay. And then, at this point in time, in this point in time Paul's writing, were there still the interconnectedness so that being part of the Jewish community and being a Christian is not two different religious commitments, but one, but there's one little, you know, a denominational difference, if you will, right? Uh, 
could some of these people that he's really hopped up on in chapter 3 be some of those brothers, you see, who were Jews and were really committed to their Jewish thing and, and they just couldn't quite, they were starting to separate themselves from the Christian element within Judaism, you know. Could that be part of the issue going on here, you see? Because uh, the fact is, well then, that it kind of connects some things together. So it's a historical question that needs to be dealt with. Okay? Frankly, my, my this, this is just freebie here, my, uh, my analysis of the historical scenario, I don't believe that it was until the middle of, uh, the middle of the uh, 60s, maybe with Nero, maybe a little beyond that, but certainly begun there, when he started killing off Christians. Uh, that Jews decided it's not a good idea to allow these Christians to become part of our community because we're going to be, you know, painted with the same brush, right? So at that point began the formal separation in my mind. Now, this was written about 62, that's what I kind of mind, 61, 62. Well, then it's still within a context where Jews and Christians were still the same religion, just a little denominational difference there, right? A growing difference, yeah, you know, right? Starting to separate get apart. In which case, that would solve a number of issues that occur in the New Testament. And a number of the questions we've had on theology. Uh, <clears throat> see, how many books were written? Let's just assume, for argument's sake, that approximately 64, 65 AD was when the split became somewhat formal. Let's just say that, for argument's sake. How many books of the New Testament were written prior to that? That would be a question, because you're in a context where you're not two separate religions. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Uh, that could solve some, maybe some interesting and difficult issues. For instance, the book of James. Mm -hmm. the issues that are involved in the book of James. Very early book, if not the very first one written, as far as the New Testament is concerned. And there's a lot of things that can we won't. Well, that was free, and so no extra tuition. Let's continue on so we don't lose track. Can we do something else before lunch begins here? Okay, verse 17. Notice it doesn't begin with conjunctive here. Okay, so now this is part of his his exhortation section, obviously, which is growing out of his irritation. It started in verse. 3 1, you know, rejoice in the Lord, you know, to write these things is not grievous for me, but it's safe for you. And now here's some exhortations. Become, having brought out the possibility these negative people are out there, maybe in your group, you know, become imitators of me, brothers. Okay. And mark out, that's the word again that we've seen before, but mark out those who are walking in such a manner as you have us for a pattern or an example. For many are walking about who frequently I was telling you, but now also weeping I am saying, telling you, enemies of the cross of Christ. Notice he doesn't make it real smooth there, right? Uh, and again, he's getting hopped up here. Whose end is ruin, whose God is the belly and the glory is in their shame, those who are thinking earthly things. For our citizenship, there's that word citizenship, they had a verb before, you know, be good citizens. Well, here's the word, citizenship is in heaven, from whom or where also the Savior we are expecting, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall transform the body of our humiliation, like fashion, to the body of his glory, according to the working of his ability, even to subject all things to himself, right? And there's a number of things going on there. And just one rhetorical thing that I note in reading it is there's two commands in verse 17. One says, be imitators of me, and the other says, mark out those who seem to be living right. right. And then he talks about those who are not living right. And then he goes back in verse 20, seemingly going back to his point of view on uh, imitation. So there seems to be a way in which it is broken down rhetorically. So we've got uh, two commands and then you break out the second command about 
walk marking out certain people and washing out for others, then you're going back to the first one. So verses 20 to 21 would be part of what it means to imitate, be imitators of Paul with this attitude. Okay. This is rhetorical for sure. That we know. Then verse chapter 4, and then my text shows, uh, shows this is part of chapter 3. I mean, same context. No, that's a, just simply a question of editorial. I mean, did the editors get it right? And when I get there, in exege detailed exegetical work, I'll examine that possibility and see if it got right or I'm going to disconnect it and put it in chapter, generally in chapter 4, with a new theme or sub-theme. Wherefore, my brothers, beloved and longed for, boy, oh, he's just kind of over, overdoing it here, huh? My joy and crown. <laughs> In such a manner, be standing fast in the Lord, beloved. I mean, there's a, he's a effusive in his uh, praise for his, these people. And notice that it becomes just before. Just before now, he apparently, sounds like, he is now getting down to the brass tacks of what that dissension might possibly have been, that he alluded to a number of sections. No conjunction, okay, Yodius, I beseech, and Syntyche, I beseech, and I, I also notice that, are we okay on the thing? Uh, okay. Yodius, I beseech, and Syntyche, I beseech, and you notice I'll repeat it. It could have said that a lot easier. He could have, you know, an English major would have said, look, you're wasting a lot of words here. You know what I'm saying. I beseech <laughs> Yodius and Syntyche. I mean, you know, that says it all, right? But maybe there's something psychological that he's doing here that he better not um, put... <laughs> one in front of another in some fashion. Yodias, I beseech, and Syntyche, I beseech, the same thing to be thinking in the Lord. Now we've seen that before. Okay, so now we seem to be coming back to the specific of what all the dispute was about. Yes, I ask also you, genuine yoke fellow, whoever that may be, some, some people say this is guy's proper name, but I don't think so, help those women. Who in the gospel have worked, uh, labored together, and this is the same word we see in chapter 1. With me, oh, gee whiz, women working with Paul, what is this? This is egalitarianism, well, this cannot be, where's my knife? <laughs> <laughs> Who labored with me, uh, with also Clement, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Right? So apparently there's some dispute there that relates to it, that relates to what's going on there, and uh, in the context of uh, people who are not apparently on the sidelines of ministry, but involved in ministry, apparently, you know. Notice no conjunctions. He's getting, you know, it's one of these things, again, where he's starting to speed up his writing, so drop off the unnecessary stuff. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it. Rejoice. You know, the gen a gentleness, your gentleness. Let it be known to all men, so maybe there's some lack of gentleness, which would go along with what we've read before. The Lord is near. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder how that reflects to the earlier statements about the day of the Lord kind of thing. Uh, don't worry about anything. Well, that's easy to say. Hard, hard to do. But in everything, by means of prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And now, see, he's, now he's connecting things a little more closely together. And the peace of God, that which surpasses all our understanding or all mind, if you will, thinking, shall keep your hearts and your thoughts. Oh, there's two different things in Christ Jesus. Question there relates previous knowledge issue. Hearts is often seen as somehow involved the whole being, and the, 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 you know, including the mind issue. And now he's broken out the heart and the mind so on the thoughts. So apparently heart in this thing may focus more attention upon emotions and as opposed to thinking. So that when I get there, you see, my exegetical work, I might just think that through a little more. Yeah. As, I, as I'm trying to follow along, and I think back to yesterday and how you talked about the different styles, of uh, uh, even how they could logically be going through. Is this, is he still, is this just one running thought? Yeah, this would be, this would be in a running pattern as opposed to a period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I, part, I've always kind of 
not necessarily followed Paul going. It almost seems like he sticks in Yodi and Syntyche there. And I mean, it makes sense why, but then as he continues in verse 4, it seems like his reference then goes back to the general mm-hmm. instead of the specific. Mm-hmm. So how do those connect? Well, let me, let me, let me finish up to verse 6, or verse 9, excuse me, and then I'll, I'll go back and make a comment okay. about that. But which is a good question, though, but in the initial reading, I'll do it, but in the initial reading, what we would do, we have those questions. And that would be something you would want to put down and say, okay, when I, when I get there, I'm going to see if I can figure out what the connectedness is here. And how, is it running style? Is it periodic style? Well, periodic style would reflect back and summarize something. Is that what it's doing? Or is it just uh, adding another dimension? Or is it, or is it continuing on a similar pattern of thought? Let me change the tape. Okay.